Let's join me in prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Norris showed up most Saturday mornings. He was there most mornings, really, sitting on a bench inside the church grounds or pacing in the corner garden. I learned his name early on and greeted him by it whenever I could. Good morning, Norris. How are you doing today, Norris? Some days he would look up, give a shy smile, and say hello. Other days he was too agitated, too caught up in his own mind, tormented. Norris struggled with mental illness. Like many of the men and women we served, though we never asked its name and he never offered it. Housing insecurity is trauma in and of itself, as is being black and poor in this country. And to look at Norris was to know that he had endured much in his lifetime. The weariness of it all showed through his worn face and his pained walk. There were times when, trying to find a way through, we engaged community mental health officers, though they were limited in what they could do. The once weekly food and clothing cupboard at the church to which Norris came each Saturday often had a long line waiting in the wee hours of the morning. We served mostly homeless and the working poor. Volunteers would come cheerfully and faithfully to hand out coffee and baked goods, organize and distribute pants and shirts in correct sizes, and bag up food items easily consumed without the need of a kitchen or cooking tools. It was my job to provide a welcome and safe space for everyone volunteers and guests alike. Like so many others, we set expectations for conduct, rules for what we could and could not do. Our guests wanted this as much as we did, and they were often the most immediate and effective enforcers. There was one morning, however, when Norris was in a particularly tormented place. Acting out, he threatened a regular volunteer. It was aggressive enough that we had to tell him to leave. Because his behaviors had escalated, we took the next step and told him he could not come back for at least a month. A full month away from the place that he called home almost every day. It was a difficult decision. We knew the importance of routine for someone like Norris, and it was interrupted. We also knew that people had to feel safe. I can just as easily defend it as I can criticize it even now. Norris is one among many whom our society has said that we cannot easily understand or sufficiently control, whose mind has come unraveled, who at times frighten us or draw our pity, who we perceive to threaten our particular community standards and unbind our carefully cultivated ways of life. In the Gerasenes, as described by the gospel writer, these were banished to live among the tombs as though already dead, howling, straining their chains, resorting to self-harm, and observed only by those charged to make sure that the shackles held secure. Over time, we built up institutions to deal more readily with these, still assuming something was necessarily wrong with the people we sent there out of our sights, 
still often restrained. As the limits of these institutions became evident and our knowledge grew based on meticulous research teaching us that mental illness can appear as a function of genetics as much as a result of lived experience, we moved to more specialized and privatized care. We have come over the last 60 years to rely on an ever diffuse system of therapists, family members, support groups, churches, medications, doctor, subscri uh, doctor prescribed, and self-administered, rehab centers, social services, and when nothing else works, steam grates, packed shelters, and prison cells. Even then, with as much as we know, Still, we are wary to talk about it, especially when it makes us personally vulnerable to do so, when a spouse can't leave the house for weeks, when a teen struggles mightily, when we see it in ourselves. We wonder, was it just the mind of the man whom Jesus met that needed unraveling that day, release from the spirits that tormented him, healing? Or was it not also the mind of the community who came to see? The ones who told him to leave, who drove him out, the community that then urged Jesus to leave almost immediately after they realized what he had done. For Jesus had set the captive free. That was what he was anointed to do, remember? The man seemed to know Jesus right off the boat. Running and bowing down, they called him the Most High God the name that non-Israelites used at times in the Hebrew scriptures to refer to Israel's God. We remember that Jesus and his disciples had just sailed, as Mark tells us, to the other side of the sea. They disembarked no longer in Jewish territory. Jesus' healing ministry, the gospel writer is telling us here, was bound neither by adherence to the law nor by confession in the God of Israel. Jesus had come to heal us all. Not yet knowing him fully, though, the man began by begging Jesus not to torment him. The Reverend Isaac Villages sees this man in the eyes of many men whom he teaches weekly at a maximum security prison. Villages lifts up this word torment, which in the Greek means to subject someone to punitive judicial procedure, to punish or to torture. He goes on to say about this part in the story that we are in the semantic world of law enforcement, of judgment and punishment and sanctioned beatings. The man implores Jesus not to torture him because that's what usually happens to him when people visit. The man sees another human being, and he expects to be harmed. We weep at this realization. It's easy to imagine that Jesus did as well, but that is not recorded. Instead, we hear his words. Jesus asked his name, a simple human question what is your name? To a person so dehumanized over time that he cannot even give it. Not his name, anyway. Instead, the disease spoke its name, Legion. 
generalized as a man possessed, unfit for normal society, he was now just a number. Even to himself, he was fading away, unrecognizable. Bilajus says, the man suffers not only external subjugation, but internal constraints as well. As if the chains press through his skin, the metal reaching into his body, gripping his inner life and crushing his thoughts, a whole regiment of dehumanizing powers has invaded his life, becoming internal to his psyche, spirits of oppression eating away at his humanity from the inside. But Jesus saw him. As Jesus does again and again in story after story after story of those named and those remain unnamed, the man in the tree, the woman at the well, the woman touching his cloak, the one cowering before a gathering of men, stones at hand. And Jesus set him free. Into the nearby swine herd, he cast the demons in a sweeping gesture that we might recognize today as that in a Marvel comic or a Stephen King novel. And down the steep bank, they went into the sea. We hear in the distance, if we listen for it, Miriam taking up her tambourine, dancing and singing on the banks of the Red Sea after the Israelites made it from captivity to freedom unharmed, while Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit did not. Sing to the Lord, says Miriam, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. So yes, when the community arrived to see all that had been done, they were undone. They did not sing and dance. They did not rejoice at the restoration of their communal body, once broken by the separation from this one whom we can only assume was celebrated at his birth like any other child, counted among them until his behavior caused too much disruption. They did not welcome Jesus to eat with them as might have been custom, they were afraid, and they were likely angry. For Jesus had just upset everything and cost them something. Not only had he made them face again the one whom they had sent away, he also took 2,000 swine out of the local economy by sending them into the sea. No wonder they wanted him gone off the premises for good. Likewise, no wonder the man was ready to go too, not ready to see again the fearful and judgmental looks. It costs us something to think anew about what it means to be in relationship with one another, to confront that for which we do not have easy solutions, that which makes us uncomfortable, vulnerable, afraid. It costs us something as a local community so valuing of achievement to have our minds shaken free of the presuppositions about status quo idols of perfectionism and self-sufficiency, of having everything handled just so. Mental illness, as so many of us have experienced, does not fit our right-sized boxes. The causes and the effects tear at our preset expectations and require those supporting to be nimble and attentive and eager with compassion. 
It costs us something as a larger society to invest in health care that attends to the body and to the mind for all people, regardless of income or neighborhood. To imagine a prison system truly built to restore rather than to warehouse. To prioritize affordable housing and jobs that pay enough so people can thrive. The insecurity of all of which are contributors to the dis-ease of mental health. Yes. It costs us something, but it costs us more to send Jesus away at this point and the man with him. The deepest cost is to life itself. Even when we do not attend to it or secret it away, it is still there. And sometimes the pressure is too much. The deepest cost is life. There is also a deep cost to community, to any chance to be the fullness of the body of Christ for one another. There is deep cost in missing what God has done for us, being amazed at the mercy shown as it lovingly arrives on our front door with a note saying, this is hard. I have been there. You are not alone. Or with a year's worth of walks in the woods as one speaks and the other really listens or with the certainty that there are no quiet whispers or targeted rejects, rejections waiting to torment you as you come through the school corridor. There is deep cost to maintaining the status quo if that maintains the expectations without any option for them to be changed. There is deep cost to refusing to be moved or changed by faces all around who implore us to see them, even within ourselves. To see Norris, that is perhaps the most lasting of what we were able to do all of those mornings even when we desperately desired to do more, even when we were tired and weary. We saw him and we called him by name. And when he came back after a month, it's a testament to him that he did. We picked right back up where we'd left off. Good morning, Norris. It's good to see you this morning, Norris. There are no tidy bows to put on this story, no exercising of demons or even a promise that he stuck around. I left that position not long after. I admit, though, that sometimes I still look for him when I am downtown. There is no tidy bow, but there is good news. There is always good news. Jesus does not let up for the sake of Norris nor any other. He keeps working to unravel at us and remake us to where we most need it and where the world cannot wait any longer. So friends, we'll come to this table in a moment the table that Christ sets before us, calling us to be fortified as his body, broken and bruised, healed and lifted up, filling us with the wine of compassion. So come, for all are welcome. Amen.